Summary of Greasy Lake by Tietze Boyle When the unnamed narrator thinks back on his life, he remembers the time when it was good to be bad, when he and his 19-year-old friends were desperate to be seen as dangerous characters. They wore torn-up leather jackets, sniffed glue, ether, and something that someone said was cocaine, and went up to Greasy Lake, the article says. It used to be a clear, sparkling lake, but now it's muddy and smells bad, but it's all the boys know of nature. It's the third night of summer break, and the boys are very bored. Greasy Lake could be dangerous, get them drunk, or lead to sex. The narrator and his friends Digby and Jeff, who are also middle-class kids like the narrator, take the narrator's mother's Bel Air past the housing developments and shopping malls to the lake. When they get there, a 57 Chevy in perfect shape is parked in the dirt lot by the lake, and on the other side of the lot is a motorbike that has been left there. Digby knows that the Chevy belongs to their friend Tony Lovett. They decide to play a hilarious joke on Tony, so they flash their brights, honk the car's horn, and jump out to press their witty faces against the Chevy's window. The storyteller drops his keys in the grass as they walk away. The narrator and his friends quickly figure out that the car doesn't belong to Tony Lovett, but to a very bad character in greasy jeans and engineer boots. The bad character gets angry and starts to attack the narrator, while Digby tries to defend himself with moves he learned in a martial arts course for phys ed credit. Digby is quickly laid out by the bad character, so Jeff charges the man while the narrator gets a tire iron from under the front seat of his mother's car and uses it to bring the bad character down in one fell swoop. As the three boys stand over the limp body of the bad character, his friend the fox screams from the car. She isn't wearing shoes and is wearing pants and a man's shirt. She also calls the boys animals. Blow-dried hair, silver anklet, and flashing toenails, says the announcer. The boys swarm around her, ripping at her clothes and reaching for her skin. When a car pulls into the parking lot, the boys run away. Since they can't drive away because they lost their car keys, they bolt somewhere else. The narrator runs to the edge of the lake to swim for it, but when he touches something in the water and realizes it's a dead body, he walks away in horror. The narrator hears the fox tell the two blonde drivers of the car that the boys tried to rape her, and then two voices, one of which, to the narrator's joy, belongs to the bad character, make threats against the boys into the night. The narrator hears the three men turn to, his mother's, car, so he peeks through the weeds to watch the bad character and the two blonde men destroy the bell air. The fox calls the bad character Bobby, and begs him to stop so they can leave. They do, and the two blonde guys are right behind them. The narrator spends a long time at the lake's edge lying in the primordial ooze and complaining about his bad luck. When he thinks about the dead body, he understands that it belonged to the owner of the chopper, who was no doubt a bad guy. The narrator goes back to his mother's car and looks at the damage, thankful for his life and for the coming dawn. Digby and Jeff join the reporter and say that at least the tires are still good and they'll be able to drive home. The three boys are quiet as they clean the car. The narrator digs into his pocket for his keys but remembers that he has lost them. He sees them in the grass no more than five feet from the car. He gets them out of the car and starts it. Two girls get out of a flame-decorated silver Mustang that pulls into the dirt lot. They look at the one motorbike in the corner of the parking lot and start yelling for Al, one of the girls walks up to the boys, stoned or drunk, and asks if they've seen Al, the owner of the bike. The boys say they haven't. The girl tells the boys they look like pretty bad characters and offers them pills. The boys refuse, and the reporter drives away. He looks back in his rearview mirror and sees the older girl still standing there with her shoulders slouched and her hand outstretched. About the author. T.C. Boyle grew up in Westchester County, New York, in the 1960s. He had a rebellious youth, he calls his younger self a maniacal, crazy driver and a punk, pure and simple, and a drug-addled early adulthood before going to the Iowa Writers' Workshop, where he studied with American masters of the short story John Cheever and Raymond Carver. Boyle's work is influenced by grotesque and fantastic writers like Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Flannery O'Connor. It combines humor and dark comedy with moral questions and views about how humans are destroying nature. 
Boyle has written 16 books and 11 collections of short stories over the course of four decades. He has won awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, the PN Faulkner Foundation, and the O. Henry Prize. He teaches English at the University of California. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.